Well, hello and welcome back for this uh, very last panel of the day. I think while we're waiting a bit for the other people to come in, I'll, I'll just um, give, give another reminder that this part here was only the first part of this Founding Lab event and that we have a whole second part of this uh, event happening at Deep Space in the evening. Um, so the, the, the public event for everyone starts at 8.30. We will have Deep Space performances of some of the student projects. Um, so I invite you all to, after this, uh, take one last look at the projects um, find some dinner and then come back to Deep Space in the evening. And then for the students that are all here, um, yeah, please move your way over to Deep Space as on six o'clock we have uh, the, the ceremony to end this Founding Lab experience for all of us. So with that being said, welcome again to this very last panel the, where in this panel all of the students from the Founding Lab are presenting what they did over the last semester, uh, talking about their projects, talking about their processes and maybe share some reflections with you about overlapping themes that they have found. So um, the, the theme of this panel is the power of narrative. I think one of the moderators will, will take some time to explain to you what it is. And with that, I would like to welcome the moderators, which is uh, Gerfried Stocker from Ars Electronica and Katja Schechner from the founding convent of the Founding Lab. So without further ado, I'd like to give the word to you. Thank you, Sintak. Hello and welcome. <coughs> it's really a pleasure to have you here, uh, especially as we are actually about to move into the Ars Electronica deep space to see the performances uh, tonight. And to hand over to this and to discuss the work that has been going on, we will be exploring the power of the narrative in this panel. And the term, the idea of the narrative has been very much used the last five, six, eight years to come up again with the idea that whatever we want to present, whatever we want to share, is shaped by narrative or by storytelling. We saw actual academia institutes on the power of storytelling take shape in uh, a many out of universities. However, at that same time that we acknowledge the power of the narrative, we also became more and more mindful of who is shaping the narrative of who is setting up the stories behind it. Why do we tell the narratives, the stories, how we tell them? And how does our personal re experience relate to it? And even more so, as we now have new voices that we are able to listen to, the power and the narrative of nature, which is basically driving a lot of the narratives that we currently have to face and have to follow, but also the power narrative of the technology and the digital, and even more so with the latest event of generative AI. So I'm really looking forward to discuss both the power and the beauty of the narrative, but also the pitfalls and the challenges that uh, some of you explored in your projects, especially uh, when it comes to the history and historical narratives. And I think with this, I might be able to hand over to Paul and Bart, who will show us the importance of the narrative in their project. Right. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, I think it's a good you know, introduction to what we've all done and what this session's about. So my name is Paul Kwekwa Kofi. Um, I'm an arts consultant, and I work in the creative and cultural industries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'm based in Ghana. Um, our project, Shared Futures, um, really was about decolonizing spaces connected to the histories of Ghana and my project partner, Bart Kuypers, who comes from the Netherlands. Um, through my sort of experience working in the creative and cultural industries, I had the opportunity to go to some of these cultural sites or heritage sites, and I realized that there was such a disparity between um, you know, what these sites could potentially be and their current state and how sometimes they were even not impacting the communities they were in. So for this project, we decided to focus on the Elmina Castle. And I think what really makes the Elmina Castle quite significant is that this castle has been there for over like 600 years. And yet when you go into the community, it's still like the most dominant feature on the landscape. And that really struck a chord with me because you know, I was touring this castle and looking out at it through the landscape, and I was wondering, 
does this have any benefit for the community at all? And is there a possibility for that to happen in some shape or form? And so it was with these ideas that, you know, I had at the back of my mind that I came to the founding lab. Um, and, you know, it was through that sort of, you know, thinking about these things that we started to have conversations around. And then I met my partner, Bart. Bart, would you want to? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, that's where it happened, at, at ITU and in the founding lab. Um, so I, I came from the other side, I came from the, from the Dutch side, and um, what I saw in Amsterdam is that there is a lot of buildings connected to the colonial history um, of the Netherlands, um, and you pass by them every day. I pass by them many times, I've lived in Amsterdam for a long time, um, uh, without even noticing that this history is there, right? So in, in Amsterdam, this history has been sort of washed from these buildings, and they have been repurposed. Um, but up to an extent where, where the history is completely forgotten. Um, and I felt it is time to, to readdress this, um, this history again. So Paul and I found each other on opposite sides of this colonial history. Um, and that's where, yeah, why we decided to, uh, to work together. Yeah, and so, you know, just having that common ground and having this desire to reclaim these spaces and to have them benefit the communities. Um, we had initial ideas about it, but we realized very quickly that, and also through the support of our project supervisor, um, we realized quickly that we couldn't sit here in ITU and sort of project what our feelings or aspirations of what reclamation could be on these communities. And so a first and very critical step would be to go into these communities, have conversations with them and have them tell us what reclamation meant for them, what decolonization meant for them. And so, um, you know, we went to Ghana. I'm, I'm, I'm from Ghana, but I, w I didn't live in that community. I live about four hours away from that community. Um, Bart came to Ghana, and we both went, and we had a workshop over there, and we met, you know, stakeholders from, from that community, and it was really insightful. And then we went to Amsterdam, and we did the same there as well. And then we had some really interesting results. You know, I think one that we can quickly highlight is that you know, for something that we thought would be obvious, like just knowing the history and interacting with it, that wasn't there. And so for them to even reclaim the castle or reclaim these spaces, there was a fundamental lack of understanding of the history attached to this. And so we realized that there are certain narratives that we needed to change and certain, you know, basic foundations that needed to be laid in order for us to even <laughs> begin this work of reclamation and decolonization. Um, and so this is the first step that we've done. Um, there are other steps that are coming up, which is uh, sort of one of the outputs which you know, we saw low hanging fruits really, was to teach the history, um, but also to share the feelings and the, the expressions that we got, the words that we got from the, from the, from the participants through an XR experience. And we, we've done like a physical installation of that um, through a poem that was co-authored by a poet and a writer in Ghana and my colleague, Bart Kuypers, which you see at the exhibition space. And so that's a physical representation of what we plan on doing in an XR environment, and then enable that environment for people to then project their own dreams and their own visions of what reclamation can be for themselves and for their communities as well. That's it. Thank you, Thank you Paul. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Dorothea. Thank you. Um, I'm Dorothea Dudlinsiak. Uh, I come from Slovenia, where I study new media art, and I'm represented by Kersnikova Institute. And I did a project called Flagged in Flux. And I would just like to quickly uh, tap into the wider context. So uh, my general artistic practice is centered around radical extreme environments. And I find them so interesting because of the way they challenge the human existence on so many levels. And here I, found, I find specifically intrigued um, by this juxtaposition between living on a planet in deep um, ecological, geopolitical crisis and trying to survive, survive in outer space. And for this project, Flagged in Flux, um, the main object of investigation was um, the flag on the moon. 
um, the moon is here um, presented as some kind of alienated elsewhere, uh, unclaimed environment, um, but still how we approach is, it, how our approach to this environment is, is still with this very colonialistic, nationalistic mindset. And so the first thing that we did when, when we landed on the moon was we planted a flag, right, uh, to, to claim this territory. Um, but the, the interesting thing about a radical environment is that the moon lacks atmosphere, it lacks oxygen, so it bleached the flag white within a few hours. Um, so it erased um, this colonialistic idea, and I call this some kind of uh, forced surrender. Um, and in this project, Flagged in Flux, um, I wanted to play with this narrative a bit, so um, I used in installation the white flag, which is, um, which is flagging because of the propeller, but what this propeller is powered by is the replica of the same hammer that was used to plant this flag, which is slowly being dissolved, and as such, it works as a battery uh, for this propeller to, to flatter the flag and basically produce artificial wind. Hello. Great. All right. So uh, my name is Nathan, and I'm from the UK. And I am a historian. I study a master's program in global environmental history at the University of Uppsala. So this project, Mechanical Learning and the Book of Nature, came together through a kind of intuitive connection that I made between my studies of Renaissance herbal books, which are books that were written before the scientific revolution to collect all the knowledge of the perceived created order into one book. And that's, that's the dream. They never managed it. But the dream is to, is to build this knowledge into a technology, the book, which by accumulation of information creates some kind of new total object of knowledge, a technology of knowledge. And that rang intuitively very uh, closely with what I was hearing learning about artificial intelligence, where the idea of, particularly with a general AI system, where you accumulate so much knowledge that it's beyond a human, or beyond the total of knowledge that a human can know. And in doing, in doing that, the technology has some kind of extra knowledge, extra perception that we wouldn't have otherwise. And the, the real similarities between these two processes, uh, that was the intuition, but the real similarities is they're both systems that require and work with plagiarism in huge ways. Because these medieval herbal books, uh, th this, is my, this is my facsimile that I made, uh, which you can see in the other room. The medieval herbal books, uh, obviously they're too long, too big for anyone to write out of their own knowledge and their own experience. So what they did, yeah, Thank you. What they did was they, they piled every reference and every picture they could find from other people into their books. And it's the same with AI systems where you just take in as much information without necessarily attributing it, without critically using it. You create these big uh, systems of plagiarism and from them you generate nonsense. So the, the medieval texts that I, I copied, uh, so in this book that I have, which I made, Here's one, I made, here's one I made earlier. Um, it's the original text from a book by a man called John Gerard from 1597. And I wanted to preserve the, the sort of nonsense of the medieval um, generated information. So in that, there's real historical information. But there's also stories that really just don't make sense. The best one is the idea of a goose that grows on trees, which you can see there. Uh, yeah, uh, and then my images are taking the original images from the 1597 book and putting them through an AI image generator to create images informed by the nonsense that comes out of AI generation. So in this case, it's uh, if you see in the top right, there's a, an image of a plant with a root, and then two across from it, it's turned the root into a basket. But at the same time, it's drawn kind of nicer, greener leaves, uh, it, it adds some truth, but it also adds a whole load of strange derivative nonsense. So in create, collecting this, I wanted to ground the narrative of AI away from an idea of mechanical machine learning 
as a future technology with no basis in, in a history of learning mechanisms. I wanted to take it away from that and ground it in this physical object that felt and looked like uh, an ancient book. Uh, and then within that book, facilitate an interaction between the sort of the generated nonsense that comes from both sides. Uh, and I think that represents the kind of interdisciplinary moment of, of um, connection. Because for me, I don't think that Renaissance Herbals is necessarily the most similar, the most excellent comparison, but it was the one that was in my head. And I think there's something important about that. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Louisa. And I will read, a <laughs> Brazilian architect and sociologist, currently a master's student in the social computing lab of KAIST in South Korea. Um, I'm working with Sion Donju, who's there recording me. And our project is called Sketches for a Self-Analysis, in which we created a theoretical framework for two separate outputs. So it's one which is my individual output called anamnesis, a framework to put myself to rest, and a knowable certainty, which will be shown tonight at Deep Space. Please don't miss it. Um, and my project will also result in a paper that is investigating different ideas and networks of interdisciplinarity in the founding lab. And I took the title of our panel very seriously because you will hear now about it, because understanding narratives and telling stories, they are the heart of our integrated methodology. For starters, let's distinguish uh, two possible perceptions of narrative. One as representation, and uh, another one which would be as uh, a, an ontological condition of social life, what we would call an ontological narrativity. Why is that? Uh, stories, they are the content of the networks that make up social reality, our relationships to people, things, places, and situations around us. They are explained by the stories that we tell about them. The stories, they help us understand our emplotment in the social space and the social time, as well as our embedding into the networks that we are a part of. In that sense, they are very important sources of social order, and which means that they are important ways to enforce a sense of control over life, over people. And control, of course, not just in the sense of coercion, but also simply in trying to understand how to navigate the uncertain social reality. This means that in trying to make sense of life, I am trying to control things just as much as the objects of my study that I'm applying my framework, right? So it's a bit of understanding this interplay between being subject and object of the same sort of analysis. So, or, or at least seeing that I'm equal to my objects of study. And so in this sense, Sion and I, we came together as people of different backgrounds with a similar interest in storytelling and a similar problem of struggling to let go of control. At first, we wanted to create a single project about trying to control our emotions through computational thinking strategies. But we got a lot more out of the process than an idea for one project. It was really a journey of theoretical self-discovery for both of us and aligning our beliefs, skills, and interests to realize a coherent sense of methodology that worked for us. Like our collaborator, Hoon, who's not here, sadly says, the direction of art and if science, if I may say, should share a logical structure with the direction of life. And this alignment is not something that you can do by yourself. We use Bourdieu's concept of self-analysis to describe this exploration of our semester-long process because it's more than just a self-serving expression. It's truly an exercise in accountability in both our creative and scientific practices. And with the current crisis of publishing and journals in science, I think that accountability is something that is, should be very in fashion right now. So the storied life, this narrativized self, it might be inevitable, but we do not want personally to be victims of our desperation for control and understanding everything and finding causes for everything amidst things that are contingent at best. In that sense, the theoretical studies uh, that we did on the role of narratives, they became a source of comfort and they also helped me build a stronger sense of what kind of scientist I wanted to be as someone who's just transitioned from architecture to sociology. That's it, thank you. Oh, hello, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm Pritha, I'm an intersectional movement and visual artist. And uh, we developed this project uh, in co-creation with Aman Prasad, who's there, also filming me, love our collaborators. 
So um, here are some visuals for you to look at while I explain my project. And I think there's a video. OK. So um, coming back to narratives and lived experiences, our lived experiences, which are everything that has happened, is happening, and will happen to us, stays with us as memories. And these experiences inform our expressions and our narratives and our interactions. And the focus of my work is on how do we create accessible, equitable, and empathetic spaces for voicing and embodying these narratives through movement and visual arts. And integrating multisensory experiences through technology is an important part of it. This project invites us to feel our lived experiences and explore what it means for our movement expressions, and also what movement means for us as humans and societies. It is a space to contemplate, to reflect and react, to explore moving bodies in space around us. And I share my research, what moved me, thoughts, words, places, feelings, senses, and invite individuals to explore what moves them. Um, I believe it is essential to make space for welcoming and valuing diverse expressions and experiences. And it is important to craft pedagogical and research environments around lived experiences of individuals. This is where my work situates in the context of founding of a new university. Between October to January, among regular research, I was designing and hosting uh, participatory workshops and research spaces with communities, which informed this installation and the sensor-assisted interactivity design, as well as the participatory performances. I wanted to research methodologies to break traditional binaries of audience, performer, artist, non-artist, and rethink what constitutes performative spaces and where movement, what like where movement art fits in, uh, you know, and means what it means for us beyond these performative spaces. And as the project progressed, a primary focus was on practice-led research, which prioritized rest and care and trying to break away from ableist and productivity-driven indices of progress. And artistic choices and decisions played an important role in shaping this project, which were informed by the participatory nature, as well as the workshops that I did. Um, the, this work draws from my background of practicing different movement arts. Uh, it is also combined a lot with facilitation methods research informed by movement therapeutic um, approaches, behavioral sciences, um, group behavior and pattern formation, and also the neuroscience of memory and learning and proprioception. And in this work, I mean, it wouldn't have been possible. It's not my work. It's possible only because of support from residencies, uh, the Kaunas 3022 residency, my co-creator, Aman Prasad, the founding lab, um, my technical collaborator, Pavila, sound consultant, Michael Wall, and also Augustus, Gary, Pitt, Jabao, Bart, my facilitator, the founding lab students, and the fellows. So thank you. Jeffrey, okay. maybe you want to? Yeah, I mean, uh, before we go into uh, more questions to you, I think what we see already is that or at least my impression is that actually the topic narrative was the most difficult one. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> and, and not because uh, I don't mean you know that you didn't work <laughs> uh, produce excellent works, but it is so much easier I think to really think about you know directly the implication of technology for this or that. Uh, but the narration now, and I think your projects are showing this very well. This is going to this very important part of seeing the big picture. And I think this is something what is somehow the, the highest aim of this endeavor of a new university, not just to you know, train experts, which is, of course, super necessary and important, no doubt about it, but how to really get hold of the big picture. I mean, this is, you know, what capabilities do you need? What kind of sensitivities do you have to bring as students, but also the fellows, the teachers, the environment? What is necessary to get the big picture? And I think this is really something that is very strongly missing. But I have a very positive feeling also, not just with your presentations, but also before, that we are uh, in a good direction towards. And uh, I think when we elaborate a little bit more on your projects, uh, we can get uh, a better understanding of this. Would you like to? 
we can start. I mean, we have some questions that uh, we prepared beforehand also, of course, which I think helps us to dive deeper in the project. I think in terms of getting the bigger picture, of course, your project is insofar very interesting because you represent two different perspectives. And uh, both of you are uh, artists and, and people who, of course, went into this project with a very high awareness already. But then how did so to say, the encounter of your different perspectives, did this contribute to a larger picture? How important was uh, the experience on site and how did this change uh, or open up maybe your perspectives? Yeah, so, so like you said, I mean, we're, we're artists and we're, you know, in some shape or form already embedded in these communities, me being in Ghana and him coming from the Netherlands. Um, and so, yeah, we did have some ideas. But I think that, well, two things happened. First of all, coming to the founding lab opened us up to the possibility of, you know, the scale of the project. And so not just having it done in, let's say, in Ghana and him in the Netherlands, but connecting you know, both communities, right? So that skill, first of all, became apparent to us. Um, and so because of that shared connectivity. But then I think that we were having this discussion when I went to you know, Amsterdam. Um, and we're just talking about how when we went into the communities, the gravity or the, the scale of the project really sunk deep within us because we thought it was a need. We thought it'd be good to do. But then when we spoke with the people, we realized it was essential to be done. It was needed. And um, it, it was a quite a sobering moment for both of us when we had a discussion and some discussions before the workshop happened and some after the workshop happened. Um, so it really just sort of sunk within us that this was something we had to carry forward and do. Mm -hmm. um, other institutions may have tried in some shape or form and sometimes have just left without you know do, not doing much. But I think what also helped for us was that this was not like a top-down approach. We didn't come and say, hey, this is what we want to do for you, et cetera. But it was a listening, more co-creation. And so this came from them and said, that, like, this is what we need. And we realized very quickly that some of it was quite low-hanging fruit that could be accomplished um, with the skills that we have and the knowledge that we have. So it got crystallized in our heads um, as much as possible. Um, yeah, but do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, um, going to Ghana uh, brought my perspective immensely. Um, there, there was no way that we could, as Paul mentioned, envision from from sitting here in in this building what what goes on in 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 a community like Almina and and what a uh, cultural heritage site like Almina Castle means to to people over there. And I think the 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 moment that that we realized that what we had thought up and was a theoretical exercise up until then was real was when when we had a, a talk before the workshop with um, a representative Michael from Brand Almina who told us we were always going in with the assumption that people know about the history of this castle that is really a very prominent building in this uh, town and that towers over the whole town um, and he told us like 90 to 95 percent of the people in this town has never been inside the castle, doesn't know what it stands for, only knows it's a tourist attraction. <laughs> People come there to visit and that's it. So that immediately started us off like at a very different point than where we thought we would start off. And I think that that's just one example of many, um, yeah, of how, how we gained insights along the way, all perpetually all the time, so yeah. Is that an opinion? Yeah. I will have another question for you later, <laughs> <laughs> but let's continue. <laughs> yeah. Ah, Dorothea, your project very much relates to the space age um, and a lot of narratives that are connected to it, like uh, the colonization of the moon, the political fights between the two big uh, political um, enemies at that time. Also, like very much, you relate to the questions of nature uh, that you very uh, showed in your um, work. Which, what I'm alluding to is, your project consists of many parts and probably also partners that came together. How um, did their respective stories influence the story and line that you created and that you worked with? 
I think, yeah, the project is about space age, but at the same time, there's this saying that we discovered the Earth only when we landed on the moon, um, because we got finally this perspective from the outside. Um, and yeah, this project is a group effort also uh, of uh, different collaborators uh, from Slovenia who helped me do this project. And also the installation itself is also kind of, there are three main elements, right? And I wanted to work with these three elements that were still used in, in this um, planting a flag, but wanted to turn the story upside, up, upside down a bit and kind of create a different narrative. That's why the, the hammer that is originally called the geological hammer, so something that is supposed to be there to, that makes you connect to the land itself, it was there for entirely different purpose. And that's why I used this process of dissolvement, which produces energy then for the flag to finally flutter, which is, of course, um, a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool. Now to you and your wonderful book. Maybe we should show it again. <laughs> yeah, well, you have to choose a good page. Because <laughs> I'm not sure if everybody has seen it. I think it's, it's ah, yeah, OK. <laughs> this should be available as t-shirts soon, yeah. is this right? <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, um, I mean, you described very well already in, in, in the first presentation this relationship and that this project really is such a wonderful metaphor for the way how we as humanity, as societies, are always gathering information, collecting what's there, and then we try to make meaning out of it, and in the process of making meaning, we are not always 100% correct. We fake something, not only uh, now with AI, but even 500 years earlier. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on your experiences also working with AI to recreate these images. I think... Oh, hello, I'm engineer. <laughs> I think the... This is a good opportunity to talk about my title, actually which is uh, Mechanical Learning and the Book of Nature. I think the idea, in fact, is also, I've also written it and the Book of Life, because nature is, is a, as we know, I suppose, nature is a, is a concept that is defined through this, these kind of books and this kind of technological mediation. Because what really interests me is the, this issue of how we take a huge set of ideas about and, and, and experiences interacting with the non-human and put it into technologies or communication methods to synthesize it with other people. And both AI and these herbal books share like a common colonial, imperial, uh, whatever kind of prestige information flaw. Because there's an idea that we have one technology in which all information can be codified. And in that technology, it will be manipulated, mobilized, used for whatever purposes we, it, it should be used for. So I really wanted to, to draw out a type of history that highlights the process of assimilation, codification of, of lived experience and stories and narratives into these technologies. And the history of that I, is what I call the history of mechanical learning, because it's the history of learning through accumulation and that accumulation is taken, it takes place through technology. And so it could just as easily have been a project about medieval bestiaries or ancient Roman medicine, or you could do mythology, you could do loads of things like that. I wanted to do this one because it was my personal connection. But the way that I would build this out into a more detailed, deeper project is to, is to, is to really focus on that conceptual way of looking at history. Because I think it offers a really important decolonial uh, criticism of total knowledge systems that offers context to a lot of the tensions around AI and its power and its implications for the future. Cool. Very, very interesting approach. Uh, well, Louisa, basically, as we are the object <laughs> and the subject of your uh, research, as you took the case, uh, the founding lab as a case study. Um, what aspects especially informed your research and also like where would you see the narrative for the university of the future shape forward from your experience now? Mm, great, so I think as a s sociologist, 
um, most of my work so far, I'm not very attached to my objects of study in the sense that I'm very, very attached to my frameworks and theories, and I really like having the chance to apply them to different contexts. So what I've had the chance of doing that several times. But at the same time, all of the studies that I've done so far, they have been related to personal context. So my most interesting insight comes from this, this immersion, let's say, even if it's some, just something that I'm a part of, like a hobby, and it becomes an object of study, something that I've done multiple times. Concerning the founding lab, I just thought that it was a very interesting place to think about our social survival. Because when you walk into an interdisciplinary space, um, especially one like this, which is quite unique because you're dealing with, um, you, you're related to this amazing art institute that is working with technology, but it's a university, so you have all these scientists from different scientific fields. Um, and the first thing everyone would do, which is a basic social need, is try to understand their place, like try to establish our footing. And the different ways of th throughout, I think the, the interesting thing was throughout starting from summer school, because we had there were so many of us, but then more developed during fall term, is how each one of us, according to our backgrounds, understood our place, how that changed, how imposter syndrome came up and, and went, um, and how these different trajectories that we each one of us had built so far informed how confident or how not confident we felt to express ourselves or to feel like we belonged or to feel like outsiders. Um, so I think that this was something that piqued my interest. And I, I got some inspiration from studies that were conducted in Brazil in the 90s um, and how different youth uh, activist groups used the word citizenship, which is kind of a big word that they could all use like with different uh, political agendas to try to gather different people under their perspective to move. Uh, they, caused, like, they made a large national movement, but each one of us had very different ideas of what citizenship meant. So for me, this was the case here because different people have different views of what interdisciplinarity is. And I think if you want to build an interdisciplinary university that's going to try to advance that as not just as a, a big word that you put on, 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 on display, but as really as um, a way of doing science, of creating new knowledge, of contributing to society, the first thing to do is what is interdisciplinarity? <laughs> and make sure that everyone, it doesn't have to be the same, it, it will never be the same, but to make sure that everyone's on the same page. I'm not sure if my study will show what the same page should be, but I hope that it at least comes with some interesting insight in how these different views are articulated and how they can be productive or not. Thank you. Coming back to the big picture and the quest for the power of narrative, we have seen, you know, some people went to Ghana, even to the moon. You went back 500 years in history. And Britta, you basically stayed within yourself. As a movement artist, as a performing artist, you were going for the question of narration by movement and how technology might be a new way to, to enhance this. How was this experience? Um, it was, I mean, this is something that I have been grappling with for a long time uh, because growing up um, where I come from, you cannot be an artist or a scientist. You need to come from privilege to do that. And for me, I used to love dance and I used to love biology. And I was like, what am I supposed to do? Because I don't want to be a doctor or an engineer. So that's how far back this goes. And I was doing research in evolutionary biology and ecology uh, until I realized that I can't do one, you know? Somewhere both of them have to stick together. And so now I ground my work in movement arts and visual arts, but it is always informed from my background and my interests. And I have realized how far technology can go in making things accessible, in bridging these barriers that citizenship, geography, and a lot of other things have um, that we have created. Um, so that's where technology fits in, in this uh, exploration. And for me, I feel um, movement is something that may be very inherent to us, but growing up, we somehow 
go in a space where we learn to sit still, we learn to conform, and we sort of suppress those expressions. And so much of our communication may be nonverbal. Uh, and then how do we go back, like peel those layers off and find out, you know, uh, this expression that is within us, and it may be something very important for many of us. And so far, movement arts is seen as dance, or martial arts, or yoga, but it's always a, a sort of a performance, you know, and it's seen as through an elitist and an ableist lens, in the sense that you need to be, you know, need to reach some, it needs to look great, it needs to look good, and it's, Otherwise, it doesn't, you can't do it. And that's not the thing. And I think that's where technology can really uh, change things in making things accessible. There are a lot of other avenues, of course. We don't have time for that. And to also go back many, many years, um, like when ballet shoes were invented by, uh, or the modern ballet shoes by Anna Pavlova, um, that was technology. So I don't think technology ever goes separate from the progression of the art, and we just keep discovering newer avenues. So for me, it's definitely um, accessibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think an uh, interesting point here is because you're really uh, working about this question also of body language. And I think what we see here is that, of course, also on the quest for uh, narration and the future narrations, we also have to think about the language. I mean, you cannot build a narrative without somehow a kind of common language. And I think that's very interesting to see, again, the different approaches, of course, in your project very directly. You go to different places, you go into the sciences, you have a very ad wonderful artistic installation, you explore the world of artificial intelligence, which is often now uh, presented to us as the new universal language and, and translation tool. So that's, I think, a very interesting common thread also among this project. Does any of you want to take it up or yeah yeah and there's like, like very very i think when i think about narrative and what i mentioned so the theoretical framework that i apply in my research it concerns like seeing the networks not just as the structure but as really like this con this phenomenological condition of social life when i say that the ties of our networks are stories um and when i think about that the reason i enjoy this framework so much is because it helps me to uh, realize a sense of um, studies that don't start just from change, but from continuities. And I think that when uh, what I find interesting about all these studies is that we are actually finding, when you find a common thread, not just across different contexts, but just across history as well, we are actually realizing that a lot changes, but a lot stays the same. Um, and I think people, especially in the sciences, especially in cultural sociology, which is my field, there's a sort, uh, there's an obsession with changes, rapidly changing, change, transformation, etc., which isn't a bad thing, of course. But we are, we are, what we are, because a lot of things don't change. And I really enjoy the way. I think this was something that was brought up a lot of times in this school. And I think one of my favorite things, maybe, about this entire group is that if you, if before coming, if you had asked me to imagine what the group of students from the founding lab knowing all the context would be like, I would have never imagined what we were. And that's definitely my favorite thing because that's what actually enables this creation of not I, like stereotypes, they're not completely useless and not completely lies, but it's good to go beyond them um, and, and finding the potential that we have to create new things, but figuring out what are the things that are worth keeping. I think that's a good point, what I like about stories, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. OK. <laughs> well, I have a follow-up about frameworks, because what I a lot of my project, what that involved was coming up with this framework. And it's a very intuitive process, I think, at the beginning, thinking, oh, if it, this feels connected. And then there was that process where you know, I didn't know enough about AI, to be sure. So I had to have lots of conversations with people who kind of pulled me up on all the things I didn't understand, which is important. And I think the, the 
I like the way that we can have different frameworks and we can pull them out and focus on different moments, different ways of thinking. Mine is focusing on those times when stories get told by non-humans or, or encoded into technology in, in different ways. That's, that's, so it's focusing on those moments. But there's so many other ways to do it and I think that's really interesting and important. Adding to that actually directly, like to both of you, is when we talk about common languages and what you said, like all of this it makes sense and can only sort of materialize when we l not learn, but when we can make spaces to listen and to understand, like not for the sake of just, you know, doing that, but to really effectively. Uh, do like real, realize it, and I think for that um, you need like quite a bit of intent and research into it because it's not natural for us, I think, to be able to listen and understand. And this is something we cultivate with the intent of creating a space where common knowledge, common languages, can thrive. You know. Yeah. So, I mean, just listening to the two of you talk, I was sort of thinking within our project's um, context, you know, what, what the narrative would be and what a narrative is. And um, I think it's more crystallized now just hearing you guys speak because I think that's what's lacking. That was what was lacking, like a common narrative or common shared understanding of what, um, of what these buildings mean in both places. And so one of the things we realized quickly um, during both workshops was just the demographics in Elmina, it was like very young, you know, demographic. And then in Amsterdam, it was a much older demographic. I remember feeling sort of, um, I wouldn't say intimidated, but wondering what we could offer to, when we saw the young demographic, we said, could they relate to this? When we saw the older demographic, it was, well, what do we have to show them that they don't already know, you know? And then going through the co-creation process, we realized very quickly that the outcomes were quite similar. And so there was actually a point in the workshop where we, we put the outcomes, when we finished the workshops, we put the outcomes from Elmina on the, on the board, and then we put the ones that they had just sort of come out with themselves on the board, and we actually did a mapping and realized that there was a shared, you know, understanding of what needed to happen, you know, the changes that could be implemented. And I think it was sovereign for all of us. And I think that when you have a shared narrative, it creates agency. You know, it creates a shared understanding, but also creates an agency and it creates, um, yeah, the ability for, for knowing how to move forward. And I think that's one of the things that's also been missing for quite some time. Um, there was a conference and I had, you know, um, there's a writer, um, sorry, his name has just skipped me, but he was part of the, of the struggle for liberation in Africa. And um, when, when that movement was going on, there was a point in time where some items, colonial items, local items could be returned back to African countries. And what happened was that the new leaders, African leaders who had come into place, actually asked that the items be not returned, which was new to me. And the reason they asked for the items not to be returned because they were worried that if the people saw these items, which were sometimes symbols for what their cultures had used for struggles and liberations within their local, it would, it would incite people or would rally people to then sort of rise up and ask for better rights and better conditions. So they had become the new overlords, and these were local, like pre new presidents, and they had become, and they wanted the items to stay there because they didn't want the people to rally around the things that identified them and reminded them that they were warriors and they could overcome certain challenges. And so the power of narrative and a shared narrative, I think, is really strong and it creates agency. Yeah. Well, maybe that's the point. Oh, Baird, no, please no, go no, ahead. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm to the next. Uh, is there is there questions that you would like to ask in the audience? Oh, there is quick. <laughs> would you pass? <laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much. I have a I have a question that maybe very directly relates to three of your projects. For others, I think it could relate. But uh, we're talking a lot about heritage, or like some of your projects talk about heritage, like about this heritage that we left on the moon, about what we've done in the past, and also I guess with your books. But it also becomes very clear that heritage changes forms, like with you when it literally it changes the color or like the way that we perceive our past changes. I mean, I'm from the Netherlands myself and I, the sort of like the very um, 
colonial history was taught to me as the golden age because we were the richest country in the world. And this is also a narrative that is starting to change. And then with you, how um, this history or the information about this, it keeps changing as well, or like the, the pictures kept on changing. So we're now with this whole university project going forward, going to the future, but yet we are bringing also our history that also kind of like changes all the time. So what is this importance or what or how shall we kind of take our heritage with us like going forward from here on out? I can, I can, uh, sorry, go ahead. The Dutch Dutch. Um, yeah, I mean, personally speaking, I think it's it's important that we learn the truth about our heritage, right? And I think these narratives that you that you are talking about also, uh, I'm also Dutch. I've learned the same in school. Uh, pieces are left out, very important pieces, maybe the most important pieces, because they're not convenient to hear for the people um, who are in power, right? So. I think the, the very first step is to be honest about where you come from, to know your history and to um, uh, familiarize yourself uh, also with the parts of your own history that you cannot be proud of. Um, and from there, there's maybe a, a possibility to, to, to build um, <laughs> shared futures. <laughs> Other, I, I was going to say <laughs> narratives <laughs> that we can all understand, universal <laughs> narratives, true universal <laughs> narratives, instead of these lies that have been told to us for a very long time. I think heritage is, is really interesting, and I've done a lots of random different ways to study heritage, but I think when you learn about it, when you find out the things, even things that aren't so concrete, like the stuff with the AI and the herbals is, is quite a loose link in many ways. It's quite a speculative link. But there is a shared heritage and a heritage of like intellectual domination there. That, you know, it's a, it's a lot of silly pictures. But when those processes that create nonsense are applied to real scenarios with real people's lives and real like ways of understanding the world, they don't become so silly anymore. You know, it becomes really important. And that's the kind of thing that you, un you start understanding when you start understanding heritage and history. Dorothea, would you like to add on it or? <laughs> 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 well then, uh, let's open up. Um, just so we engage the audience as well. Claudix, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm from Peru, and when I arrived to the founding lab, I had a Peruvian understanding of coloniality, or even a South American understanding of coloniality, given that I share um, imposed language, religiosity, and culture with a lot of South American countries, and Brazil was... Um, one barrier that we had was that you had a different colonizer. <laughs> and now we cannot uh, speak the same language, for example, no? Even though it's common, like uh, it's, it's, it's um, similar, yeah, it shares a, a root. So as all the conversations, like uh, talking with Paul, talking with Prita, I was like, wow, that's how your colonization looked like? <laughs> like, that's what your colonizers did? Like, oh, mm. Uh, it helped me understand colonization is an event that happened very differently everywhere in the world. Actually, it's very related because when there was independence in South America, then, oh, now we can, we have to get the resources from other, this part of the world that they, uh, some nations refused for, for, for some time, no? Because it was more dangerous and there was malaria in Africa, for example. So once you start tie, tie, tying up the notes, you say, yes? It makes a global history that has to be collectively rethought. And I wanted to get your opinions because colonial is one world, one word. And I want to know what do you think if any of these words, is it useful for you, given it means nothing really? Uh, what, what do you feel like? It could be a lot of people hate post-colonial because it's not over. Anti-colonial, is it per pertinent? Decolonial? How can we, when we talk about colonialism, how can we actually give a more um, informed perspective of what we're talking about? 
colonization of the moon, for example, it's completely out of the spectrum also for me. Like, tell me more about it. Like, which words is it good to talk about this? <laughs> very, very, uh, very brief. Um, since I'm the, I was talking about how to use words productively, right? Um, the, the, your vision of the word that you're employing, with regardless of what word is, is informed by what you do with it. So I think that a lot of people, they put up the word decolonial, anti-colonial, post-colonial, whatever it is, and they do s nothing um, to actually, not, um, it's not simply undoing, right? Because you cannot undo all that was done up until now with the countries that were, that, or the peoples that were colonized that suffered through um, these processes. But it's what you do with it. So when you, when you take this word, uh, do you take it seriously or is it just for show, starting from that? And then the second thing would be, I think, it, uh, I'm gonna say this as a mixed person, okay? Because I am, I'm, I'm, I'm mixed Brazilian, so I have, I, have, I have African heritage, I have native Brazilian heritage, I have European heritage as well, since I'm quite white passing. Um, being a hybrid, it means that uh, the problem with the word is that we always conceive them in terms of binaries, right? It, it either is or it either isn't. And I think that since it's gonna be very hard with, it, be it citizenship, decolonialism, be it interdisciplinary, since it's very hard to find a real common productive thread, the most importantly is can you imagine it outside the framework in which it has to be exactly what you conceive of it, but more what you do about it. And I think in this sense, I'm gonna be like, I'm your friend, so I can say that what you do is amazing in that sense. But the most important thing is whether it produces some some change or it imagines something new. It can be like, I don't know, I can't even imagine that like techno anti-colonialism, I don't know, but as long as it's actually imagining a new possibility and, and, and co-creating a future in which the colonialized peoples are no longer struggling to get by and sharing a different type of world almost, we talk about that so much, I think that the word itself doesn't mean as much as what you do with it. Yeah, um, so I was just sort of thinking about your question and I, and I hope I have it right in my head, but you know when we had, doing our founding lab um, exercise, we had this workshop um, where we had to put together a video and um, <laughs> I came around and I came around and um, I was asking you guys what is the word decolonize or, colonial or colo colonialism in your language? And I think the most surprising thing for me and just what dawned on me right there and then, because I hadn't thought much about it, was that in most of our local languages, we don't have a word for colonialism, right? There's no local word for it, but there was in Spanish, <laughs> and there was in English, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but I couldn't think of a word in my local language to say colo, you know, colonialism or to colonize. You know, it was, um, the, the idea, there's, there's a phrase which probably just means to to subjugate someone, to oppress someone. You know, there's a phrase for that, but it's a long phrase. It's a number of words, which means we, we didn't do it or practice it enough to, to <laughs> shorten it and say, this is what, this is a thing. This is a thing, right? So, so it's interesting for me to, to, you know, to hear you say that. And it's the same thing. I think, you know, just talking about what happened in your country, what happened in Brazil. I mean, the same thing in West Africa, right? I mean, in Ghana, for instance, uh, the neighbor that we find close affiliation with is Nigeria. And it's not even because we're close to Nigeria, but because we're both colonized by the British. But then in between, we have Togo, and we have Burkina Faso, and we have French, and we have almost no relationship in terms of uh, like affinity, right? And it's sad because some of them are just our neighbors, right? And so there's lots of trade that has come as a result of that, you know, just being able to, you know, interact with them and understand them and spend time with them. These have been some of the impacts, right? And so speaking of decolonization for us, one of the things we thought about was, I mean, this conversation about decolonizing our textbooks, for instance, so that maybe we can add a lot more local language, decolonizing like our clothing, what does that look like? Um, and one of the things that struck me when I went to the castle, to be quite honest with you, was, so in Ghana we say, you know, I have a friend who's a dancer and she, she made a video and she, in the video she said, history is taught to us from when the white men arrived. That's how history was taught to us, which almost seemed as if we didn't have a history before then. And so, we grew up with the notion, even in my generation, that white was best, right? The West was best. Um, so Western movies, Western clothes, the way you speak, 
um, all of that, right? I mean, I'd, I'd be listening with some with a generation, like a much older generation, and was listening to the news, and they'd get upset when somebody didn't speak English properly or made a mistake, you know, with, with the accent and all of these things. And it was just quite recently that we started getting away from that. It's like, hey, you can speak English and make a mistake. It's not your local language. It's not your language. You speak your language fluently, you know, and you speak it really well. So, you know, so, so I think it's these ideas, and that's how we, we are starting to define what decolonizing means, right, for us. Like coming back to ourselves and feeling confident in ourselves that this is who we are. This is trying to form an, an identity because we've realized that because, we're, because these ideas are still in our head, we don't have a common identity that's strong enough for us to say, this is not for us, we're moving in this direction. But slowly, I think with the younger generation, we're starting to realize that and we're, it's, it's sitting in our souls and we're, we're happy about that. Yeah. Thank cool, you. thank you. Well, with this, I think we're gonna wrap up, especially as, okay, very short, <laughs> not three questions this time, but I'm yeah, loving yeah. to hear one, okay? <laughs> so, a uh, short one question of mine is, uh, this question has been the question of my life, throughout my life. Uh, when we share our narratives, we usually fall into the trap of using the words that a lot of people use, uh, the, like the empowered languages. Or less than that, like we tend to just share our narratives through within our own community, which we share the experiences or viewpoints. But as a social scientist, I think that we can gain the most from the opposite people. And uh, we tend, we want to talk to the people who are in the opposite sense. But if we cannot really find a connection or uh, a shared point between them, how can we try to not lose interest in others' narratives? Or how can we actually talk with those narratives in that? sense. Okay. Anyone who wants to take this question? Nathan? Nathan? No, I was just saying, sorry, could you, could you repeat? <laughs> <laughs> the question. <laughs> yeah, the other question, yeah, could you, sorry, repeat it, sorry, you say that again. How do you uh, communicate with the narratives which are totally different from you? I think it depends, again, on intent. Um, you can only speak to somebody who's willing to listen. There is no, like, if somebody's not ready to uh, listen or be sp present with you, I mean, and if they are, then I think you have already reached halfway, right? And then, I mean, I agree that uh, you, I, I don't know if you can gain the most, but it's definitely a very important conversation or a space to make where you don't, you know, work within your circle of acceptance. Um, and, but then it has to come with that um, intent that the other per like spaces also want to make space for you. And I don't think how we can force that. I, I mean, I'm also curious to know if that's possible. So yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe <laughs> because we will right. take these conversations into the future, <laughs> the way you actually said it is, this is a, exactly the space a university should be, where you share different narratives and you come together to talk about different narratives, learn different narratives, and explore this within your university to which you come from, different spaces, especially if we are lucky and being able to create a university like this that's very much outward looking interdisciplinary. Uh, and this is exactly what we are doing now. We are going and looking <laughs> onto more stories, narratives, shared experiences. We're moving towards the Oslo Electronica Center, and I'll give you the word in a moment, but I'm really, really, really grateful for the collaboration with Oslo Electronica over the past year, nearly, and uh, maybe much longer through my life. So I'm, I'm really happy to have that, and it was, I'm very grateful to each and every of you that you came, that you shared, that you produced the work, that you supported the people here, including uh, everyone uh, from the staff, the technology team, everyone here. Thank you very much. And also, of course, big thank you to you, Katja. Big thank you to Gerhard for being here today. 
And indeed, uh, we are ending the session here at ITU now. So thanks very much for coming.